Thank you very much for this nice introduction. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. I think it's the, probably the most inspiring place for robotics. It's the pro probably the most influential place in robotics on the world. And this is due to Gert, who did such a wonderful job in the last decades, especially because he's, he's not thinking in a one, one dimension. He's thinking about systems. And I think this is what I share with him. I feel myself also a mechatronics person, and I'm trying to show you a couple of our results, our work we are doing, um, probably more with a systems perspective. I would like to, st to start with a quote who von Karman mentioned once, some time ago. Science is the study of the world as it is. And we probably all feel also scientists at universities and in research. But engineering is the creation of the world of tomorrow. And I think Gerd is one of these really persons who is on one side doing science, but he is really contributing and shaping the future in robotics and beyond. And I think this is also what engineers have probably as a strong advantage compared with other science. We really have an influence, and especially robotics, I think will have a strong influence on society in the future. So I would like to speak today on some of the issues we are working on in my lab at ETH Zurich, mainly on legged mo locomotion flying robots. I will start with some other more real robotics, and I think what is in common with legged and flying robots is that le at least for some time of their um, actions and missions, they are not in contact with ground. So with flying, they should be not in contact with ground for long times, but for running robots, it's something similar. So you have more or less, you're um, loosening the, the touch on the ground. And this makes probably these two fields quite very inter interesting and, and inspiring. Nature has evolved impressive locomotion concepts for various environments. If you see a cat, how they are walking, or even if this, this other animal here, I don't know how it's called in English, how they are really very good in, in very rough terrain, or then birds, how they can maneuver very uh, elegantly in the air. And today, engineering has also developed a lot of efficient, highly efficient locomotion concepts. I think for efficiency, we're probably better. Trains are better probably than walking. A bicycle is probably more efficient if you go for long distance. But technology has by far not catched the beauty and the competence and performance of na nature. And I think there is still a lot to learn from nature, not directly bringing it into technology, but actually to get inspiration from nature to be, uh, build more performant and more sophisticated robots in the future. Let me first start with also some wheel locomotion. Because we started with wheel, wheel locomotion, it's, I think, a little bit easier because you are in permanent contact with the ground. But also with wheel locomotion, you can do quite interesting tasks in quite rough terrain. We have seen this morning a couple of examples also in space operations. And just recently, some of my students, which are actually students from Bachelor, they had the dream to develop a ball bot, which minimizes the contact to more or less ideally one point with the ground, but still it's a permanent contact to the ground. And what they came up with is a ball bot, which I would assume that's the most performant in the world right now, which can lean forward 17 degrees to accelerate or to brake, um, can go up to quite high speeds, and can move very elegantly. Here you can see some elements how this robot moves around. Um, and this is only thanks to new technologies to sophisticate the control, the full system modeling of the whole system so that, that you can really influence, the, um, do all these maneuvers as you can see it here. Another example is this shrimp robot, as we called it. This is uh, more than 10 years ago. And this was also designed by students. And I'm always extremely excited to see how students really can do great jobs. They are, have crazy ideas and they can do much more than we often think. And they were actually, their task was to do a, a robot for space exploration. And so they came up with this robot design, which probably does not look too much different than what we have seen on the, the NASA rovers. But for us, it was extremely impressive to see that even with this much small robot, which has the wheel size, which is a, about half of the height of a staircase, it can easily move upstairs. 
And in this time, and I think still today, this type of size of robot um, can, is probably more agile in, in a lot of different terrains than walking robots because they are still very complex and I think we have feel, uh, still a lot to learn. Of course, this robot had then also to move in, in um, the mountains because Switzerland is in the middle of the mountains and you can see also in the mountains the robot can do quite a nice job. So uh, now, of course, what is the application of this type of, of lo wheel locomotion? We have seen, of course, space exploration. There's a lot of cleaning job jobs, but we had also the chance to get involved into um, industrial service robots um, a, co a couple of years ago um, with Alstom together because they have to service their machines. They have to go into the machine to test different things, to um, uh, inspect their machines. Today, they have to disassemble them. They have to disassemble them. This means typically a couple months of no operation. These are big generators, big turbines, which are producing energy. Each day, if they're not producing, it's a loss of income of about one to two million euros. So it would be nice to have robots to go into these machines. And I would only like to show you two elements of, of robots we developed together with, with um, Alstom, and which actually created then the company Alstom Inspection Robotics, which is a joint venture between our university and uh, Alstom. This is one robot which uh, is uh, built with magnetic wheels, but I if you have magnetic wheels, you have also to need these very small wheelets to get rid of the magnetic force if you go around the corner. And this is a robot which is extremely flat. It's about less than a centimeter in thickness, which is intended to do inspection between a in a generator between the motor, uh, the rotor and the stator. And if you can do this, you can actually get rid of the disassembly of the motors and still inspect the coils and the magnets in the motor and gain a lot of, uh, of time. So I think there is a lot of applications and I personally think this industrial service domain is probably the most promising in the near future because their money sometimes doesn't make such a big difference. You can imagine if you can actually reduce the servicing time by one month, you can spend a lot on the robotic side because you're losing every month uh, every day about one million of income. So let me now move over to legged locomotion. Legged locomotion it was something I wanted to start a long time ago, but I only started about five, six years ago when I moved from EPFL in Lausanne to Zurich because I was there in the mechanical engineering departments. And we had the, the, the students really to do nice designs. And so the first question is how can we get inspiration from nature? You most, probably most know that motion in is pre preliminary a passive oscillation. This has been demonstrated in different types of animals, also with humans, um, where actually you inject only very small, at the right moment, small pumps of energy, and the most uh, part is a passive oscillation, so you are running more or less in resonance. This has been investigated with horses, but also with humans, and even in walking, it has been shown that during walking you are storing energy in your muscles and recovering in during uh, walking. And then what you have see, uh, here, this is studies from animals. On one side, is, this is the oxygen um, consumption, which is more or less a measure of energy consumption. And the other side is speed. And you can see in a horse that you have different speeds, different gates. Here is walking, trotting, galloping. And for each of them, you have more or less an optimal point. Um, if you go at higher speed, walking is not good enough and not so good anymore. You can have a less efficiency, but trotting is better and then galloping. So this is the different ways of movement. And our question was, does this also appear if you have um, artificial systems? So the first question is, or the, then we, we started with modeling a simple leg, which has actually an elastic part and the motor part on the joint here and in the linear, uh, linear motion and a spring in series. And then what we did, we did the different gates and we studied what is the uh, mechanical cost of transportation, which is meaning how much energy you need for transportation. And if you do this, you can see here the simulations, simulation, which is a somewhat a jumping simulation. You will see that on one side you have the, the energy here in, in function of the period and, and during touchdown the biggest energy loss or the, the biggest the energy is stored in the, the spring which is here and the total energy 
of the kinetic and potential in energy is going down. But you're cover recovering this, and so in average you can have a very nice movement, and in an ideal case, of course, you are even not losing any energy. So if you do this now for this different speeds, on one side you can see then that you don't have to put a lot of motor energy in the whole system and still can uh, run pretty fast. And if you then do this analyze for different speed and then cost of transportation, we have been able to show that there is exactly the curve we have seen also in nature, that you have an optimal speed for a given situation means the given spring mass combination of this lag. Now, of course, the qu next question is, would it, this also apply to, to other gates and other arrangement of lags? So, for example, this two-leg walking or then um, another type of gate, also with two gate, which is more, more a, a jumping gate, or then you go further with, with system which have, uh, for example, also uh, two or four legs, if you think of, of a three-dimensional thing. And we studied this in the models, and what we came out is that all the different gates have actually somewhat a minimal point. So there is an optimal um, speed energy consumption uh, point. But unfortunately, up to now, we couldn't uh, exactly find the same situation. So depend on the gate, they are not um, having, uh, they're having any losing more energy. We still have to study more on this, but on one side, I think we can do the same thing what nature does, but we have to understand where the losses are and which is the best gate really to, to use in different arrangement of legs. So, of course, once you do the simulation, you would like to do it also in, re real, in a real system, and this is actually what I very enthusiastic about to bring all these elements together. You have to learn also through building real system. And this is actually more or less a lag with a serial elastic actuation, where the actuators are here at the, the, in the body. Then we have a chain for the first uh, lag. And what you have seen before is the big spring, which is in the, the lower part of the lag, which is actually a, some sort of a torsional spring, which is acting on the, on the knee joint. Then we have also springs which are actually uh, acting on the other motors, but these are less big springs, so because the most energy during touchdown is actually st stored is in this spring. You can see here a little bit more detailed spring, so you can either move, have this on, on the end point, and then you are moving it with the motor, or you can have the motor blocked, and then this, the spring will actually compress and store the energy. Now, if you do this, you can um, then build this in reality. So this is the lag we have been before, and you can start a jump. And of course, then you can study what's happening during his jumping motions. So on the power side, you have on one side the total power in red, you have the spring power and the, the motor power, which is fed into the system. And actually, you can see here that this is exactly what you want to do. Of course, there is still potential to optimize, but we are only on one side putting positive motor power into the system, so we don't have to take power out. And the biggest part of the power during touchdown is stored in a spring and released on the other point. The other thing which you can also see is that the motor doesn't move a lot, because the whole movement during touchdown is stored in the spring, and the spring is moving. So you can see here is the motor movement, and here you can see the, the joint and the knee joint, which have a lot of movement, but not the motor side. So this, I think, is probably the basis which allowed us to go think a little bit further and think, can we at one point probably run then with, with, like it, uh, with electrical driven motors? We have seen a couple of robots which are hopping, but I think I would claim today there is no motor driven, electric motor driven robots which are really um, running for a longer, longer period in a very controlled way. So before I quickly show where we are with the quad, with four wheels, to, uh, four legs together. Here, what you can also do once you have a motor in series with a spring, then you have automatically also a, a force sensor. What we have, we are actually measuring also the deformation of the spring and the motion of the motor. And so the difference is actually reflecting directly a force. So you can then easily have a torque control um, leg here which is actually um, a motor with a harmonic drive, which has a lot of friction, but you can see it, it um, can be in torque control. You can then also position control the whole, wheel, 
whole lag here, it's with a simple PID control here with a more sophisticated control where you can see during the, the air phase, you typically have to position the lag and during the, the contact point, you are actually doing not much, but mainly work, uh, let the, the spring recover or store the energy and release it later on. So we are still not where we want to be, but hopefully soon we will start to run. But what we have here is now the same lag we have seen before, but to, uh, built together in a robot with four lags. And actually, it, you have seen this very, very often, but what the difference is with most other systems, you can, even during walking, you can move the robot around because it's torque controlled. So this can easily um, absorb unequal terrain, other forces coming from, from outside the robot, and this allows you to have much more reliable and robust system, and uh, hopefully will then also soon allow us to, to run. So something what is probably the vision to bring this system in a situation where you can more or less um, do real um, experimentation with what you can see here in, in, in simulation. This is a simulation from Stellion from Disney Research Zurich, and we started now to collaborate. He already has this model on his simulation tool, and now he can bring actually his simulations and his controls back on the real robot. So let me go over to the second point, which is the flying robots. Walking, I think, is still limited because you have to have contact with the ground. It's somewhat very complex, and in, the, and in the, a lot of situations, probably fly is the, flying is the most easiest way to do something, to do even inspection, to do, um, to do help uh, rescuing works. So a simple example is here, that you have access to a destroyed building where Climbing into the building is very difficult if you are in contact with ground, but if you fly in, this can help. Or this is the street parade in Zurich, where these are all people. And if there is something you have to interfere and to see what is going on, a um, big helicopter would be too dangerous. Probably a very small um, helicopter might help um, to get a view from the air. So what is the challenge in here? What we are looking for is, is very small flying vehicles. And you can see this nature solved this problem, but we are thinking in reality, in, in, with artificial system, we are pretty far from. There is structural is, in, uh, issues, there is dynamics and control, especially if you scale it down, the dam dynamics goes up, the control power you typically have is going down. So then is the power autonomy, the sensor systems, what can you put on because you are limited with payload, and of course the calculation power. And we are trying to address this in, in two ways. On one side, to fin find new ways how to navigate with, for example, vision only, and on the other side, also how to generate enough energy for the long endurance flight. But let me quickly first start with this slide, which I think is really interesting to see what it means to fly for different scales. So there is all these different flying systems, artificial like airplanes, but also flies on the other side, and they seem to behave to a certain extent to some basic physical laws. And actually basic physical laws, one element is what is the, the loading of the structure in relation to the total weight of the system. And this is an equation which of course this factor might change a little bit to depend on the structure and the material you're taking. But what is important here is the weight, weight divided by the, the, the wing area is proportional to the one of, of one, to, uh, one third, power of one third to the weight. What this means is the smaller you get, the less you have a problem with structural loading. And of course, in reality, in, in, in nature, you can see this, the smaller an animal gets, the more chances is that it, it flies. The biggest birds, they don't fly anymore because they have probably structural problems. The very small flies, they fly. So this is something interesting that this is probably the only strong point about having small flying vehicles because they are la structural load is lower. But all the other aspect is more difficult because you have limited power calculation, power, and then so on. Then, of course, the other thing is how performant can small airplanes be? And I think they're also there. We can probably be even better than nature. And I have here two videos from colleagues of mine, Rafte Andrea and Vijay Kumar, which are doing fantastic maneuvers and control of quarter to helicopter. Here you can see they playing ping pong. Um, these systems are actually uh, um, tracked by, by a Viking system from outside, but they use really full dynamic 
and can do stuff which you can, could never, probably 10 years ago, never have imagined that you can do this with small flying aerial. The other thing, a quadrator has actually four degrees of freedom to control, uh, but in dynamics mode, he can, uh, you can actually reach regimes of the flight which are in static, not reachable, and here you can see that you can even fly through a, a window, or later on we will see that it can even fly on a wall. So we can do a lot of with this control. I think motors are extremely dynamic, and we have all the basics really to do more for autonomous flying. So we started actually to think of the whole system. How can we bring systems smaller? We started with um, quarter helicopters about seven, eight years ago, and then went through. I will only quick to quickly go through a couple of videos. This was about seven years ago, the first quarter which had really also some obstacle avoidance on it. Then we wanted to be become smaller, and then the question is, can we become smaller with quarter Because this the dynamics of the whole system and so the control loop speed has to be much faster, IMUs have to be fast, faster. So we then went towards the coaxial system, which here is shown they're extremely stable. This system is only controlled in yaw, in yaw but not and in height, but not in XY. And you can see it has nearly an, an automatic feeling that it comes back where, where it should be. And then you can stretch this for further and, and have very small systems which are about 50 grams and 10 centimeters. In, in diameter. So, but what is the critical issue with this? Um, I think it's the navigation, because you are very limited, you cannot really carry lasers anymore if you go very small, so the only thing you remains is cameras, but still you have a very limited calculation bo uh, on board. Now what can you do? And I will probably speed up here a little bit, but only give you a, a glimpse a lot of people are doing this, uh, we are not the only one, so tracking features in the environment and based on this doing a measurement, a, a motion measurement or uh, doing visual odometry or then even doing a map of the environment. Uh, so you are, have one view, you have the second view, then you're trying to track mo uh, the, the, Im the, the features in the environment and then you can get the motion vector. One thing which is for example for a wheel system very interesting, a wheel system is typically on the ground and it has one degree of freedom at a single moment, it has one point of, if you have an Ackermann steering. So what this means is that all the motions in the image should refer to the uh, same movement. And this allows, for example, to have one iteration and a very fast algorithm to do this motion tracking so that you have a histogram and see which are the, the motions and based on this you can actually find the instantaneous uh, center of rotation. As you, most of you know that with a single camera, which is used here, an Omnicam, you have one scale which is missing. So you have only five degrees of freedom which you can watch in the image. Now the question, how can you get um, the, fifth, the sixth one? Interesting, something very simple you can do. If you have a car and if you put the camera, what you typically intuitively would do on the axis of the rotation, so in the center of the back wheel where the axis of rotation is, then you cannot do anything about the scaling. But as soon as you move, move it out of the axis of the rotation, you have this distance, which is constant, and through this and the motion of the car, you can actually do a very easy estimation of the scale, and so you get all the information you need for, for motion estimation. And this is what we did here for in the city of, of Zurich, with the images taken by the car, so you can here see the omnidirectional images, you can see here all the features which were um, found in the images and, tr and then tracked. And if you go on with this, you get a pretty precise motion estimation where we, what, we, what we are using here is only the camera image, nothing else, no IMU, nothing. Only by really tracking this and using actually this information which is li linked with the, the steering or the, the Ackermann concept of the car, which helps us to be on one side faster and on the other side also more precise. Now for an air vehicle it's a little bit more difficult because you, have, you follow not on the flo uh, ground floor, you don't have a central uh, point of rotation, and so you have to track really all the, the coordinates or the, the features in the environment. You can see here our first example with a quadrator, which is actually doing here full V-slam, visual slam, with tracking features in the environment um, and then building up a map and uh, following along the map. 
This, as you can see, works pretty reliably if you have an environment which is, has enough textures which actually can extract good features. Now, but this is still a major issue, and this brought us as a next step, even mechanical engineer all of a sudden to work on, on features. How to find features which are easy to calculate, fast enough, you can do it online, on, on board, on the helicopter, but which are um, rotation invariant and scale invariant. And this is the brisk feature which uh, was uh, um, proposed uh, pretty recently, about a year ago, which allows us to have a very nice tracking of, of these features and with a lot of changes in scale. So you can see you move forth and back, you can see the, the features and the, the correspondence between the two images. And you can also turn them around. And so this is the new type of features which will help in the future to go even with small helicopters with limited calculation power uh, to do a nice, nice uh, tracking and actually at the end even mapping. So this is used in this context, for example, where we are not flying, but we are using a camera with an IMU, a stereo camera, and only moving around in the environment. You can see we have here also features which are, we are tracking, and based on this building a an, an 3D map of the environment, which is over more, multiple corridors pretty precisely and, and allows for navigation, for localization, for small vehicle. And with this uh, new type of features, we can do this, do this really on board with limited calculation power. The same then can be applied, for example, here in inspection tasks. This is a boiler inside a part of a boiler which uh, have to be inspected. They are typically about 20 meters in diameter, 40 meters high and you have to go up and, and inspect the, the pipes, which are these, these structures. And using this uh, feature-based navigation um, with a stereo camera on this quarter helicopter, you can really ma move very precisely and do, on one side, uh, build a map and also localize the robot. So let me now first to the last part, which is about microsolar airplanes. And I'm extremely excited to see here this airplane um, which has exactly the same vision, I think. The only difference is that we are trying scratching it to as small as possible, and this is probably more this, uh, that you have enough payload to do really precise mapping of the environment. The whole thing, work we started in micro solar airplanes, was initiated with the vision, can we fly on Mars? And if you fly on Mars, it would be probably best that, that you don't have to get off and, and land, but you would stay forever in the air. So if you want to look, would like to, to look at this, what you do typically is to do modeling. So on one side you have all the um, airplane parts with the solar cells, battery and airframe, and the, which gives the total mass. And on the other side you have the aerodynamics and condition, which gives the power for level flight so that you can stay in, in, the, fly, uh, in the level. And if you bring this all together, you can fake, make a calculation and you come up with with uh, somewhat different uh, elements which contribute. You have also the scaling, which is part of the whole calculation and all the motor drive and so on. And what we came out of this with a fixed type of structure is that on one side we have here the flight altitude, which is possible. The line means that with this battery power, this flight altitude is possible at this wingspan. And interestingly, what you can see at, for a given design um, of the structure, you have an optimal. The smaller you get, you have more problem that you cannot have enough payload. The bigger you get, you will have some structural loading which is not acceptable on, uh, anymore. And so what we did then, we designed an airplane which is about this size, which with a battery of 400 um, watt hours per kilogram would be able to fly at about 10,000 meters. If you would be, if you would like to fly on Mars, you would have, a, you would need a battery which is about twice as this so that you can fly on Earth about a 20,000 meter, which is somewhat similar to Mars, if you consider also the lower gravity on Mars. So we built then this, this airplane with integrated solar cells and flew in about three years ago um, a 27-hour flight, which means that we showed that we can fly forever if the, the, sun, the, the, the sun conditions are, are good. So we, we landed with full batteries and we would have uh, been able to, to go on which I think is, is a very interesting um, application because in some situation, 
I just heard in Germany they have a forest fire. Sometimes it's very good to have a permanent view what the fire is doing, and this type of airplane, which are light, is not so dangerous for the environment, could do a lot of good job. So this, you can see, it's a still a very fragile, small airplane, which, which is uh, still very good um, for, and uh, which was able to fly for permanent. And so the next step, because we believe in this application field, is that we start to design a new airplane, which is a little bit closer to this one, as you can see, which has also some redundancy. So you have two propellers. If one breaks down, we can still actually continue to fly. All the actuators actually can, one single actuator failure will not be allowed to continue to fly. It's about the same size. It's a little bit heavier. It's not designed for continuous flight. It's flight designed for long flights, but with additional payloads. So we can fly in dark, so without sun, about 9.5 or 10 hours uh, with flights. It depends on the sunshine, uh, even much longer. So this new airplane has um, additional camera in on board and an infrared camera on board, which allows us to have much better um, inspection of the environment, and it should be ready to fly um, early next year. So this brings me to the end. Um, Ground and air, air locomotion in complex environments is still a major challenge. I think we, we have made a lot of progress in the last years, but I think there is still a lot of things to do. Nat natural, natural movement is outperforming artificial systems still imp impressively, and so it's probably worse to, from time to time, to look at nature and, and learn from nature, especially, for example, in walking. Running uh, robots, I think, are becoming a in reach, um, if we explode the dynamics and if we have this zero elastic actu actuator so that you, because otherwise the mat motors would be much too big and you would never be able to run, at least not running more than, than a couple of, of uh, minutes. Um, recent results in feature-based visual navigation, I think, uh, showed that even with, with small systems, with limited calculation power, you can do um, visual slam and navigation in, in different environment. And uh, we have shown that solar-powered continuous flight is, is feasible to die today, even with small airplanes. With this, I would like to end and thank Gert for his inspiration, his dedication, his vision, and also his transpiration. And I think this is what, what makes him probably different to most other scientists and roboticists, that he is willing to go through something for a long time. He is insistently moving forward, with, with integrated uh, torque control motor and joints, for example, which only this, I think, makes the difference and makes applications possible in the future. So I think science has to bring, and so Bruno Cicillione, although they mentioned this, we have to bridge this gap between scientific research and also then the applications in order to bring robots to the market. I would like to, to end with two videos, which are probably more also some fun part in it. So if once in the future you want a beer, that's easy, that's the fridge which really brings you the beer in a very simple way, so you don't even need wheels. Or we are getting close that people get in love with robots and robots might be probably all of a sudden jealous about the humans. Thanks very much for your atten inten uh, attention and it was a really great pleasure to, to speak here and to be at this wonderful event. Thanks.